A condition to MMA fandom should really be the ability to handle disappointment, because while we are treated to many fulfilling moments, when misfortune does hit, it hits like a Ford Escort. But of course, that's the game, and usually fans, well, they just have to accept it. If you buy a ticket for an MMA event, it'll usually read card subject to change. And that's not only a warning and insurance policy for the promoter, but it's generally a guarantee. I'm Tom from MMA On Point, and this is Top 10 Disappointments in MMA. Number 10, Ronda Rousey's career end. Thanks to Ronda Rousey's strange relationship with the MMA community, fans often dismiss the role she played in moulding how it looks today. Because honestly, no one, no one should be subjected to what's going on over on her YouTube channel. But she is the reason why women can fight in the UFC. And that's not hyperbole. It's some sweet public knowledge. She made Dana White go from this. When are we going to see women in the uh, UFC, man? Never. 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 To this. I mean, some of these guys still live in the 1920s. The way that they talk about women, these women deserve to be here. They're great athletes and they deserve to be right, here. And, they and her career was pretty enthralling too, going six and zero before the UFC in both strike force and arm bars, winning their bantamweight title. And when the UFC absorbed the promotion, she was just handed the UFC title because she was so far ahead. She armbarred her way to defending the title twice in her rookie year, following it up with four more wins that saw three by strikes. And while that proved that she was evolving, it was actually the catalyst for her downfall. People, and especially her coach Edmund Tarverdian, began lauding her striking, including Joe Rogan, who argued that she was delivering perfect, clean techniques. She's throwing perfect, clean ah, technique. Come on, those were wingers. Dude, those well, were fucking wingers. It was a chaos wingers. fight, but she's throwing clean technique, sure. man. This seemed to give her a false sense of pugilistic invisibility, and as a result, she leaned heavily on her boxing despite being a grapple queen. And in a story old as time, of course, it backfired, literally kicking her in the face when she ran into Holly Holm. And while the knockout was devastating enough, the stark visuals of her looking out of her depth hurt even more. And in the aftermath, she retreated into the shadows and was criticized for not handling her failings like a champion, cementing it all with a fast and dominating loss to Amanda Nunes on her return. While Ronda Rousey was certainly polarizing, it's never how you wanted a pioneer to exit your sport. Number nine, Anderson Silva versus George St. Pierre never happened. The significance of Anderson Silva versus George St. Pierre might be lost on newer fans because nowadays it appears that every time a new champion is crowned, they either look north or south, almost as if a lateral view to their division doesn't exist, making super fights the norm, the very thing they really shouldn't. But in 2006, before the concept was diluted, fans wanted Silva versus St. Pierre more than Vanderlei wanted a Fuck Chuck. Fuck Chuck. The two became UFC champions just a month apart, with Silver dominating Rich Franklin for the middleweight title in October, and GSP avenging his loss to Matt Hughes for the welterweight title in November. Sadly for the fans, though, things pesky things just kept getting in the way. Firstly, Matt Serra briefly interrupted those plans, capitalizing on a title shot earned by winning the Ultimate Fighter to dethrone GSP in a shock upset. But the reign didn't last long as Serra swiftly lost a rematch the following year for the Whispers to once again re-emerge. And while Silva was dominating and running out of contenders instead of looking down, he moved up to light heavyweight to fight James Irvin, who to be honest, I still consider the GSP the light heavyweight to Vision. But fast forward to 2010, after St. Pierre jabbed Josh Koscheck's face to pieces, Dana White began warming up to the idea and the fight seemed imminent. But things, pesky things, kept getting in the way. St. Pierre's lackluster performance against Jake Shields didn't inspire confidence in his chances at middleweight, and all the while, challenges continued to emerge. Conversely, for Silva, a budding rivalry with Chael Sonnen was capturing everyone's imagination, and as time past, the super fight drifted further and further away until it was too far gone. Wilson, please don't go Wilson. So the question is, where the hell is Golden Boy Promotions when you need them? Number eight, Chuck Liddell returns to MMA. There you go. 
Go on, boy promotions. Chuck Liddell wasn't the first MMA legend to make an ill-advised comeback, and Lord knows he won't be the last. Hashtag give BJ one last chance. But the news of his second coming was met by a sense of dread which we never felt before. After years of fighting with a style not designed to protect his brain cells, the Iceman was rendered unconscious in three consecutive fights. Rashad Evans and Rich Franklin put him so totally limp that it was in if he was preparing to appear on a live broadcast. But as a result, Dana White, his promoter and friend, though we don't really know if Dana has any real friends, forced him to retire, and for reluctantly conceding, Chuck was hired by the promotion. However, when Sufa sold the UFC to the company now known as Endeavor, Liddell was relieved of his position and began expressing interest in fighting again Oh gosh. So finally in August 2018, much to the outcry of the collective MMA world, as if millions of voices suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly silenced. He announced he'd meet Tito Ortiz in the main event of Golden Boy MMA's first show, a whopping eight years after he retired. And aside from a handful of fellow fighters, everyone not involved was against the idea, even his longtime coach John Hackleman, who said he'd support him but hated the plan. He was a wise man because Ortiz, who had always been several steps behind Chuck in their primes, eased to victory, knocking him out in the first. Number seven, Josh Barnett versus Fedor Emelianenko cancelled and Affliction crumbles. When Affliction signed Fedor Emelianenko versus Josh Barnett in perhaps the best heavyweight fight available outside the UFC, I bet the last thing they imagined was their business looking like a foretelling of Cyborg's shattered skull. But before the metaphorical flying knee to the face, Affliction, established by the clothing company that found its niche in MMA, with one foot already in the business, doubled down and started promoting fights. As a result, the UFC banned their fighters from wearing their merchandise, a blow, sure, but Affliction, Affliction, was striving for bigger things. They premiered in July 2018, backed by the Don himself, Mr. Trump, and they stacked the deck for their first two cards. But they were expensive productions, with payrolls reaching 3.3 million apiece before additional fees. For example, Fedor was reportedly paid $300,000, but his actual compensation was more into the seven figures, and while the mere existence of another company willing to pay for their top talent was a win for everyone, sadly it just wasn't viable. Basically, Affliction was burning cash, but with Fedor and Barnett going 2 and 0 in their last events, a showdown between the two had set up a massive fight for a third event. So what's the saying? You gotta spend money to make money. That is, of course, Unless you're Josh Barnett who's spending money on steroids and then 10 days out Barnett popped and you know everything was off. So without a headliner, they cancelled the event before ceasing operations and returning to sponsoring UFC fighters. And for Fedor versus Barnett, well, despite them competing for Pride, Affliction, Strike Force, and now Bellator at the same time, the fight continues to evade us. Number six, the Detroit dance, Ken Shamrock versus Dan Severn 2. Who likes slaps and fights? Nick? Habib? Well, boys, you would have absolutely loved Ken Shamrock, Dan Severin, and their rematch and sexy dance at UFC 9. Firstly, for all of those who have never seen it, lucky you. And secondly, you can probably figure out what happened by its fitting title, the Detroit Dance. Yeah, they, they pretty much circled the octagon in speedos like aqua dancers in an invisible swimming pool until the time limit expired. And they were actually so inactive, you can count a closed fist on how many strikes were thrown. But the fact is the fighters don't deserve all the blame here. They were competing under strange conditions. The sport, which was about to enter its dark ages, were under intense scrutiny with John McClain, no, sorry, John McCain, the then Arizona senator, campaigning for its ban. Consequently, the show was a cancellation risk right up to fight day. However, it was ultimately approved, but with modified rules that outlawed headbutts and closed fists 
punches. The penalty for disobedience for, sh for throwing a punch at a UFC event was a fine or jail time. And that certainly did influence the proceedings, well at least for, for Shamrock, who did throw open hand strikes several days like that. Fuck that and threw punches and only received like verbal warnings from John McCarthy. Severin ultimately won by split decision, but despite fighting in his home state, the fans instead of, you know, just going crazy and celebrating, the fact they just, they were more excited that the fight was over. Number five, the Conor McGregor versus Habib Nurmagomedov mess. At UFC 229, Habib Nurmagomedov produced his magnum opus against Conor McGregor in front of a busload of bustling new casual fans. Yet, that that will always be secondary to everything else that happened that night. Rewind to UFC 223, the carcass of another Habib versus Tony Ferguson cancellation, as Nurmagomedov was set to face Ally Aquinta, and at a pre-fight media event, Nurmagomedov, accompanied by his team, confronted and slapped Artem Lobov for comments he had made. Well, that didn't sit too well with the GOAT's close friend, Conor McGregor, who promptly flew from Dublin to New York to get revenge. So he just stormed the parking lot in an attempt to find Habib, but only managed to throw a dolly through the window of a bus, crashing glass like the fragments of Cyborg's skull. What's my obsession with Cyborg's skull, you ask? It haunts my dreams. McGregor was then arrested, stripped of his title, allowing Habib to win the championship. However, once McGregor could return, the UFC booked the fight with Habib, but nobody was ready for how dark it got. At the fight week press, McGregor, whiskey in hand, went on a tirade, not only only on Habib, but also his family, customs, and religion. Ultimately, Habib prevailed though, but after forcing McGregor to tap, he turned his attention to Dylan Danis, McGregor's BJJ coach, vaulting the cage to start a massive brawl. And while a fiery build-up was guaranteed, no one was really ready for heads bouncing off concrete around the arena, but I guess it's a paradox. The event is easily the highest selling MMA pay-per-view, and while it's disappointing that it got so dark that's partly why it was so successful and with that said i guess i guess i finally understand batman Number four, Fedor never signs with the UFC. Fedor Emelianenko was the crown jewel of many an MMA promotion, except for the UFC. But for much of his career, there was no real reason for him to fight there. When he was ruling the roost in pride, they had the premier heavyweight division. There he won classics against Crow Cop, Nogueira, Hunt, Coleman, just creating a legendary win streak. And by the time the UFC purchased Pride in 2007, his legacy was pretty much secured. But with Pride gone, elite fighters had few alternatives, so the Russians' arrival in the UFC finally felt very close, especially since a showdown with Randy Couture, their heavyweight champion, was an MMA fan's wet dream. Have we, have we used the Just Bleed guy yet? But Fedor and his jumper being too hipster signed with Bodog fights and then Affliction sending a ripple effect across MMA, leading to Randy's departure from the UFC. Randy wanted to fight Fedor so badly, he vacated the title and left despite having two bouts remaining on his deal. But despite their famous face-off at the inaugural Affliction event, the fight never materialized. Couture was legally bound to his UFC contract and Dana White cock-blocked us all for our adultery. Fedor went on to beat Tim Sylvia and Andrei Olovsky instead before Affliction folded, and then all roads were once again leading to the UFC. They reportedly offered him two million per fight, plus pay-per-view points. However, his team insisted on an M1 co-promotional clause, and the deal fell apart. And then he just joined Strike Force, and well, you know, I mean, Bigfoot. And the thing is, while there were other opportunities for the UFC and Fedor to come together, obviously, after Zufa purchased Strike Force, once Fedor's legendary win streak was broken, leading to the disappointing three fight losing streak, fans' enthusiasm dissipated and it was too late. Number three, John Jones. That, that's it. Ent entry over. Number two. Oh, do you, you need me to explain why everyone's disappointed with John Jones? I mean, okay, I, I guess I can do that. Let's smash it like one of those, you know, 
medicine commercials with all the side effects. In 2005, he was suspended for committing a hit and run, leaving a pregnant woman with a broken arm. He avoided jail, but received 18 months of probation. He violated that probation by allegedly drag racing a month before his rematch with Cormier, who won the title in his absence. The Cormier rematch was then supposed to headline UFC 200, but three days out, John was pulled and suspended for an anti-doping violation. But he just got one year for lightly ingesting a contaminated substance. He finally got that Cormier rematch in his comeback and won, but he popped again, this time for Torino Bowl, and the win was overturned to a no contest. However, his penalty was reduced twice for a contaminated substance for providing USADA with substantial assistance. Knock. The T-Bow in his system still shows up today due to his so-called long-term pausing effect which forced the UFC to move an event from Las Vegas to LA because the NSAC wouldn't clear him. Then came a DWI in March 2020. Police responded to a gunshot, found him in the car inebriated and just with four counts including aggravated DWI and negligent use of a firearm. He pleaded guilty yet he got no jail time again. He got four days house arrest in a global pandemic plus one year's probation. Done. Oh god. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, in short, it's just, it's pretty disappointing that one of our greatest continues to just f fuck up as if his life depends on it. But let's let's move on. Number two, Habib Namagamadov versus Tony Ferguson Saga. The Habib versus Ferguson Saga would turn the most rational person superstitious. And as we all know, superstition ain't the way. The two were first matched up at the Tough 22 finale in 2015, but that fell through after Habib suffered a rib injury, which actually had him considering retirement. Luckily he didn't, the fight was back on the following year and then Ferguson got her and it was off again. But the UFC determined not to take an L, rebooked it. However, what happened next takes the tiramisu. I mean, takes the cake. What even is tiramisu? Coffee flavored Italian dessert. It is made of lady fingers dipped in coffee. Like what the fuck is that? Anyways, they made it to fight week this time, but suddenly Habib was hospitalized just hours before the weigh-ins. The whole thing turned controversial because of a clip in the countdown show showing him pretending or maybe not pretending to eat tiramisu while in camp. He insisted it was a joke, but Ferguson disagreed and claimed his indiscipline was the issue because who can't refuse lady fingers dipped in coffee? Anyways, four times was the charm. The fight was rebooked again with Ferguson now interim champion, but in typical Fergie Habib fight week, Tony got injured, the goat got slapped, Bus got smashed, McGregor got arrested, and Habib came champ. Typical. And the most typical thing of it all was Tony tripping over a cable whilst doing media, injuring himself so severely he needed surgery. Honestly, I don't know why there isn't like a fight pass series that just doesn't follow him around. Pair him up with Mayhem Miller and watch them take down a SWAT team. I'd watch the fuck out of that show. Anyways, do you believe in curses? Well, evidently the UFC didn't because they rebooked it for UFC 249 because you know, I don't know, five times the charm? And obviously you know what came next because you're living through it, I'm living through it right now. A pandemic hit and it appears we'll just, we'll never see this. We'll, we'll never fucking see this fight. It's done. It's done. I'm done with this. And number one, the Fool of Pride fighting championships. Pride wasn't just a legitimate rival to the UFC, it was, for a time, the biggest promotion in the world. In 1997, three years after the UFC's birth, Pride debuted to 50,000 fans in the Tokyo Dome. And like its rival to the East, its debut featured a Gracie. The UFC had Hoist, whereas Pride had Hickson, the man who Henzo called the champion of of our family, Burn Hoist. Their premiere came at an ideal time too. The UFC had just sunk into its dark ages, a period where it was struggling financially and had its events blacklisted from cable pay-per-view. So for fighters seeking greener pastures, Pride was it. With a white ring, ropes instead of cage mesh, a distinct rule set that allowed soccer kicks, a technique that the UFC outlawed around this time, a focus on pageantry, and a fan base that was a cultural far cry from its rival, Pride was different and good different. They promoted outstanding fights from Fedor versus Krokop to the host of legendary bouts fought in their prestigious Grand Prix. 
but sadly it just didn't last. In 2006, Fuji TV cancelled the promotion's TV deal due to Pride's links with the Yakuza going public through a tabloid. And in March 2007, they sold to Zufa, the UFC's parent company. And while the plan was to run Pride as a separate entity, with no distribution in Japan, and after they suffered such a PR nightmare, that never came to fruition. Pride died and Japanese MMA, well, MMA in general has never really been the same. Bring back the freak fights. Thanks so much to Robert Palin for writing this list. Glad to have you back, brother. And as always, thanks so much to the Michael Jordan of MMA on point for editing it, MJ Moore. You can follow him at Tom MJ Moore. Thanks for watching that video. Please do like and subscribe. We upload three jaw-droppingly juicy MMA videos a week to get your teeth into, and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Make sure to follow us at On Point MMA and Tom A. Ransom on Twitter, and you make sure you have a great day.